the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> Mr. Matt Larson. Uh, if you guys don't know, uh, Matt was the one of the pioneers and creator of the Modern Army Combatives program. Uh, it, you know, the, what the Army was doing before wasn't really good, and Matt just kind of reinvented the wheel and, and really reestablished something that will be not only a probably what's the best combatives program the military's had up to date, but also really modernized it and really brought it to a thing where it's, it's beyond just hand-to-hand -hand fighting and it goes into as much part of CQB as you would basic rifle marksmanship. So, Matt, how are you today? I'm good. It's good to All be right. here. Yeah, glad to have you here. So, um, so today we're talking about, you know, com you know con concealed carry weapons and combatives. So, why don't you give us a little bit of your, your thoughts on concealed carry? Well, uh, my, my first thoughts on concealed carry are that, um, that combatives is almost as much a part of it as, as is marksmanship. Um, you know, weaponry being the biggest part of, you know, it's who gets their gun to bear on the bad guy at the, you know, first in the fight is the most important thing. Yeah. So how do you get that there? You know, we were, we were just discussing before we started that the... the FBI statistics are right now that just under 33% of fights happen within seven meters. This is with, with uh, specifically with police shootings. Yeah. Um, and that 7% of the cops that are killed, this is over the course of uh, 10 years between 2015 and, and before, um, were killed with their own handguns. So imagine that. that. That means within five, I'm sorry, not five meters, five feet. Within yeah. five feet, that's as close as we are right now. Yeah. And this is not much of a marksmanship challenge, so there's something else going on there. Primarily weaponry, you know, can you get your gun to bear, is your draw stroke good, etc. But as the 7% as the of cops being killed with their own handgun shows, a lot of it is grappling. Yeah. And a lot of it is who's going to end up with the weapon in their hand. So I, I, I would say, you know, there's a... A lot of people don't want that to be the truth, but it is the truth. And if you're, just as a blanket statement, if you're not training on how to win that close fight, you're not really training to win a third of the fights. Right. So even, so combatives wouldn't even be a system about hand-to-hand, -hand, you know. So it, Yeah, I, I hate the phrase hand-to-hand -hand combat, yeah. and I, I also hate, uh, um, you know, unarmed combat, because yeah. there's, there, there are, Literally should be no unarmed combat. Uh, I, I uh, uh, you know, Richard Francis Burton famously said that, uh, uh, if you don't know who he was, he was a, a British spy and a sword master and a explorer and a bunch of other cool things. But he, um, he famously said there's, you know, there's no race of men so mean as to not have the use of weapons. Yeah. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. or something close to that. And, and it's, it's really true. So that's like, so can we be armed? All the time, well, I just imagine if we're flying today from here to Cairo or from here to London or someplace, can we be armed? Well, certainly. We can have a ballpoint pen in our pocket, and if somebody grabs us from behind, that will be a great aid in getting them to let go of us. <laughs> right. so, so weapons are, are, should be a natural part of your fighting. It, right. it, it doesn't mean that, uh, it doesn't mean that the, the weapon use is, is the fundamental either, though, cause, because the weapon is a tool. The use of your body is the fundamental. Right. And how you, whatever tool you happen to have, it's gonna it's gonna grow out of how you move your body. Right. So, you know, you're 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 known as a combatives guy, and you you kind of have that whole thing where you gotta kind of overcome that definition. Everybody kind of thinks that combatives is this MMA program or a jujitsu program. So, what is the point that combatives? You know, concealed carry or marksmanship. What is the point that these guys, this these two systems, start to intersect? Well, for me, it was for me um, weapons and uh, and gun handling and everything was the predecessor. Uh, I didn't start doing any martial arts until I was an adult, and and I grew up in shooting, and uh, you know, my grandfather was a big. Uh, um, Shooting champion, uh, um, precision rifle marksmanship and whatnot back in the seventies. That's not stereotypical of Texas yeah, at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, his actually his best friend was a metallurgist, and they used to make uh, all their own, uh, make all the weapons that he shot. It was bench rest shooting, yeah. but uh, the, you know, necking down uh, Russian seven millimeter rounds <laughs> into two two three yeah. tight neck. Anyway, really, really precision marksmanship stuff. 
So I, I grew up around that, yeah. and and then I my first duty station was was Tokyo. So I started training karate and judo, believe it or not, um, at the time. So 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 the weapons fighting, shooting specifically comes before combatives uh -huh. in, in my story anyway, and. I, I don't necessarily think that's the optimum way to train, yeah. but I think that that that's you know, it just illustrates that uh, there's no combatives without weapons. Right. You know, there's you know, there the the chances that you would be completely unarmed fighting someone else who's completely unarmed in some sort of real circumstance, and then neither yeah. of one of you would have the ability to make a weapon out of something around there. Yeah. Is is slim, and it's probably the wrong way to think about fighting. Right. Right. So, so what, what is, you know, all your years of combatives, I mean, how long have you been in combatives since, what, 95 or 93, <laughs> well, really? Yeah, I mean, I started training, my first duty station was Tokyo, I got there in yeah. 1984, so I right. started training karate and judo in 1984, and, and that slowly became combatives over the course of the next, um, it was very slowly, because it was a lot of karate and boxing, kickboxing and stuff for a yeah, long right. time, and, um, but really, it'd be in combative starts in 94, 95, when I started learning jiu-jitsu, and, and just at, at that was the time whenever martial arts in America were transforming, and so my personal journey, you know, paralleled that, uh, transforming my martial arts mm -hmm. into, you know, modern, realistic martial arts. Yeah. So, um, I hope that answers your yeah. question. So, with, with all this experience and all these various martial arts, you know, uh, is what you have, Black belts and judo, jiu-jitsu, karate, and well, what what lessons all this, all of these things brought into like how do you approach your, you know your concealed carry? Well, um, first off, I think everything is situational. Situational, you know, you have the met the, the met T analysis in uh, right. in military situations, and I think that uh, you know that that concept you don't necessarily have to follow an acronym, but that right. concept that you're going to evaluate every situation tactically yeah. um, is how I approach all of the above. As I just said, the, the flight to, to London scenario, I'm not right. going to be able to have a handgun on that, so yeah. it's still concealed carry if I have a ballpoint pen. So if I, whatever the appropriate tool is for the situation is is kind of the way I would say come at it. Let me see, I'm getting up. Question. Yeah? Uh, so, no, never mind. Well, so with that being said, you know, if, uh, if if you think if you think about things tactically, then then you're thinking about everything tactically as you go through your day. You remember yeah. General Mattis's famous yeah. quote? I think he was the one originator who said, uh, "You know, be polite to everybody and have a have a plan to kill everybody in the room yeah. or something <laughs> yeah. like that." Yeah. You know, that that really is just you know, it, it's a it's talking about a mindset, and that mindset is that I'm the warrior in that room. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's safer. Everybody except the bad guys are safer because <laughs> right. because I'm there, and that means you have to be switched on. Switching on means you're making the appropriate tactical decisions. Right. So, so that goes all the way back to I got up that morning. You know, even before mm -hmm. I ate right, I got myself fit. I made sure I was trained, and mm -hmm. then I got up that morning. I put on clothes that fit the tactical situation, and that could, that could be anything. Maybe I'm going to the beach today, or maybe I'm going to some banquet. Right. So. You know, what are my what are my choices that I'm making for those two circumstances? Yeah. So this is now we're not talking about a technique question, are we? What's the no. technique I'm going to use to to carry whatever sort of weapon I decide to carry when I go to the beach right. or when I go to the banquet? So if you just intellectualize the process, then pretty much the answers will come. I, I think so, and then and that also puts us all on the right path of looking for better answers. Right. Because you know I don't ever want to stand in front of people and say, look. I'm going to tell you all the right answers. Right. Any any teacher who says that is a fool, right? It's not a good teacher. The the the, the better teacher says, I'm going to put you on the path. I'm going to show you the answers that I've found, but that doesn't mean that's all the answers. It doesn't even mean they're the best answers. Right. It just means it's a process that you should be looking to, you know, you should be adopting. Now, another thing, too, that's very uh, unique because, you know, a lot of people know for a fact that you know, civilian competition kind of takes things off asthma as far as, uh, you know, what the tactical situation or what the combat situation is. So why do you, why are you such a big proponent as far as, like, you know, getting out there and competing and mixing it up with the, all well, these people so this in specialized real, fields? This is a real good uh, um, point because one of the, one of the debates yeah. that goes around incessantly 
is the, the value or the um, or of competition, whether it's good for you or bad for you as, right. a, as, a, as a fighter, as a whatever you choose to call yourself. Um, and one of the things we've sort of established it as a principle in the in the combatives that I teach is that um, is that competition a it has many benefits. There's no right. doubt that the best marksmen in the world are competitive shooters. There's right. a reason why you know the tier one units hire the top you know IDPA and IPSC and USPSA competitors right. to come out and teach their guys about shooting. Right. Those guys don't know anything about tactics. That's not why they're there. They're there because they are have very good shooting skills, and those shooting skills came from yeah. being competitive in those sports. Right. And so that that relationship holds across the combative sports. You know, the the guy who is a, a rally driver is going to have better driving skills than the guy who drives himself to work every day. Right. Right. So it's the, it's the same thing across the board. Um, that doesn't mean his rally driving skills are a, you know. Are the do all be all of, of driving? Yeah. You know, maybe the circumstance he's going to find him himself in is something that never comes up in rally driving, and he never had to practice for it. Right. So therefore, if he limited his training just to being competitive in that discipline, well, then he wouldn't necessarily be as well trained as he could be. Yeah. Um, but that's not to diminish the value of the competition of driving his his levels to where they they were. So if we take that you know perspective of if we're focused on victory in the competitions, right. that's not necessarily the right focus. Right. We go to the competitions because they get us better. I go to shoot an IDPA match, or I go to you know grapple in a in a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu match, or fight in an MMA fight, or or enter a rally race. Yeah. All those things, you know, I enter that because it's going to make me train seriously for that event, which right. is going to drive my skill set higher than if I didn't do that. So if you that that if 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 as long as I stay focused on real fighting, yeah. that's a very positive thing. Now now it's super easy to get off task. I mean yeah. it's super easy to become focused. In fact most people do. Yeah. And since we know most people do, that this you know if you look at the people who are out there training and whatever they're training in boxers, they're not training to defend the double leg takedown because you don't right. do that in boxing. Right. You know, MMA fighters are not defending their balls yeah. because <laughs> you can't punch each other in balls, right? Yeah. They're not defending themselves from being bit or their eyes gouged out. That doesn't mean they don't their skill sets, you know, aren't great. If you got in a bar fight, rest assured it'd be good to have a proficient MMA fighters on your side. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, right, yeah. you know, and the same thing is true of marksmanship, right? Yeah. It's pretty easy to to get off task and you know, the next thing you do, yes you're doing marksmanship, but the skill sets are not necessarily translating hundred percent. Right. So we have to stay focused um, on that event. Right. Or, or, or on what we're really training for. Okay. So so it's, it sounds like everything is just a lesson of context. As long as you keep context, it's really good. You know, just get out there and train, and just kind of commit to getting out there. Yeah, and, and you know, since we're we're talking about concealed carry, yeah. I, I imagine that uh, you know, how do you how do you become a proficient person at concealed carry? Yeah. You know, because what does that mean? That means that you are oh, carrying the appropriate weapon. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, in a way that it's not. Uh, a detriment to your life or anything as you go through your daily life. Well, anybody who's carrying weapons all the time, you know, they start to learn all the lessons of carrying weapons. You don't have to take a class in it to know, I'm going to wear like this and, and cover like this so right. that I don't have, you know, so people can't tell I'm carrying. And, you know, and, and as you start going through your life, you know, taking that approach, I'm going to take the warrior's walk. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, go through my life being a good person to have in the room for right. everybody there. As you do that, then the lessons start coming. Yeah. And it's the same as uh, it's the same as I've decided that I'm going to be a good fighter. Well, uh, you know, if I don't ever show up to the gym and train fighting, yeah. well, then I'm not going to be a good fighter. Right, right. You know, if I don't ever like a, you know, I can't say theoretically when I'm in it's a sketchy situation. I'm going to then have my weapon on me if I don't make it a routine to have my weapon on me. And if I do that, then I'm going to start making better choices. Right. Because just the concealed portion is going to be trained every day. Right. Now, if I take those same lessons, you know, this is the way I find myself wearing my handgun or my ballpoint pen or whatever the right. weapon I'm bringing. If those are the ways I find myself carrying them when I'm out there, so then I'm going to take that to the range when I'm shooting 
and then practice my presentation and practice my fighting or all those things. If I take that approach, then my skill sets are going to be pulled together. Right. If I don't, however, you know, it's always like the like the joke about the you know the woman trying to pull the handgun out of her purse and she digging through the pins and gets it out and it's got a gummy bear sticking out at the end of it. Well, whoever <laughs> told her it was a good idea to carry a weapon left out the best, most important portion, which was and you must be proficient with it. Yeah. You know, and that doesn't mean, you know, I've gone to the range several times, I've shot some bullets down range, I hit all in the A ring. This yeah. doesn't matter, you know, the farthest thing from the most important right. can be because that five foot fight when you're trying to get that weapon out that you've concealed very carefully <laughs> <laughs> that you can't get it to bear on the bad guy, well, yeah. it's useless. Yeah. You know, there was that video we saw going around this week of the guy carrying his weapon and he didn't have a um, you know one in that chamber and oh, so yeah. so you know him and his son both got shot down while he yeah. was trying to yeah. you know, cycle around into the chamber well you know he had been carrying it that way for a long time had made the decision yeah they didn't realize it was a life and death decision when he made it but he had made the decision that the way he was going to carry because it was safer yeah was in stage two or whatever stage three or whatever he was yeah. doing that decision you know, it, the, the tactical decision that should have been now, uh, my weapon's not ready to go. I can't draw it out in this circumstance, right? right? right. Yeah, that, that was a sad story. And, like, you know, when I, when I see that, people who aren't carrying one in the chamber, it just, to me, that just screams that they're just not confident. And if they're not confident, it's just that they just don't got good training. Yeah, I mean, we make a lot of decisions in our lives, yeah. you know. And, and most of those decisions are things like, I believe I'll decide to have pizza tonight, which, yeah. which means I'm probably going to be heavier than I should be if I make that decision <laughs> routinely. Or I decided I want to go to the you know, weight room today or I decided I didn't want to. Right. Um, those are the same kind of decisions as I've decided I'm going to take this handgun that has these safety mechanisms, which I do not feel confident having one in the chamber with. Right. You know, I, I was a 1911 carrier for many years. And... Um, and you know, you see a lot of people carry a 1911, but they don't want to carry one in the chamber because that means they got to keep it cocked and locked if it's going to yeah. be ready. That's true, right? So, you know, or or worse, they're going to have one in the chamber. They're going to lower the round. That means in the heat of the battle, they might as well have you know an old double action, I mean, a single action revolver, yeah. while West style. They're going to have to pull the hammer back on it. So those are those are all decisions, right? Well, yeah. I love this gun because the romance of it. Yeah. You know? And there's all these wonderful things that I would like to identify with about, you know, carrying the 45. And I don't yeah. have enough, you know. And for years and years, the best marks, I mean, the best uh, gunsmiths in the world primarily worked only with 1911s. You know? right. So, so there are lots of people making that decision. Yeah. Um, but if it, if if it, the going along with that decision meant that you were not feeling confident to carry it, you know, cocked and locked all the time on safe. Right. Well, then there's consequences to those decisions. Yeah. I think too. Uh, another thing people always always uh, overlook is that you know the bad guy's gonna have to drop on you, you know, and like you, you got to train for that situation. So, what what training methods do you recommend as far as like for people to do conceal, you know, conceal carry with with that being in mind? Well, there's an inherent artificiality in training that you always know something's gonna happen. Right. So it's very difficult to train for somebody's got to drop on you. I used to. <laughs> this is a funny story, but I. I used to put my guys, when I was a squad leader in Second Ranger Town, I, I put my guys on uh, Kato orders, I used to call it, so they would take turns every day Yeah. one different one would attack me. And and uh, you can talk to those old guys, there's all funny stories. They would always get me like uh, when I was drinking at the water fountain or, <laughs> you know, or just coming out of the shitter stall or yeah. something like that. They would always pounce yeah. uh, right at the bad time or like when I was in the parachute harness or something, always like a uh, yeah. sort of difficult circumstance, right? right. And so that was really great training uh, yeah. because, you know, I was always like, Kato, you know, like, <laughs> running around. But, you know, it's not, not that that's practical <laughs> or, even, or even desirable, but, it, but it, um, that was what I was trying to do at the time was keep that going. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, uh, I'll give an example. When people run the tour drill, mm. for those of you all not familiar with the tour drill, is, uh, um, it's basically where the 21-foot rule comes from. So, you know, somebody how far away can they get to you before you can draw your weapon to bear. And if you do that, the way I do that with my students is do it with, um, with uh, airsoft or with some so you're shooting mm -hmm. the guy. Yeah. So imagine he's, he's standing 10, 20, 30 feet away from you, yeah. <coughs> pardon me, and he's got a, 
a paintball mask on and he's standing with a martial arts belt in his hand and whenever he's got the drops or whenever he decides to run at you and hit you with this belt so you have a little bit of you know fear yeah. of pain coming at you yeah. uh, you've got to draw your weapon bring it to bear and shoot him mm -hmm. so so that, that that 21 foot rule that cops use to, to show you when you need to draw your weapon uh, comes from a similar version of that drill right well um, if you can imagine that when you run that drill that that is, an, I know he's about to attack. Okay. I've already made the mental decision that I'm going to draw my weapon and shoot him, right. which are all the hard parts right. of the concealed carry conundrum. You know, like, right. a, um, you know, when do you recognize that it's a threat? When have you made the mental decision that you're going to shoot them? Right. You know, because this is a life and death decision, isn't it? Right. So that happens in a split second. And the time it takes somebody to run at you from 20 feet, that's... You know, that's a, a second or so, right. you know. Um, and that's, if you have a skilled draw stroke, yeah. you know, that you can probably get it down underneath. That's, but that's assuming you've made your, your mental decision. What if they're not coming from straight on? Yeah. What if the first thing that happens is it hits you? Yeah. And now you're on the ground. Yeah. You know, and that bad, that's why bad guys think, right? Bad guys try to pick soft targets. Yeah. And then they also try to pick where they have the jump on those soft targets. You know, they're like the lion waiting in the in the tall grass. Yeah. Along comes a gazelle. Wow. Yeah. You know, and that's the way the victim always is. Um, you know, the times when you would be going, "There's the bad guy. He doesn't know I'm here. I'm gonna draw my weapon out." That doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> funny too. You're bringing that up of uh, you know, because I see, you know, in the the point of what you're saying is just be trained. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, like I see these grappling matches when the girl beats the biggest, stronger guy, and everybody thinks it's. You know, oh, jiu jitsu is the greatest martial art and all that. And I, I think, no, I think it, what I see is that she actually just has more training than him. Yeah. You know? Well, the, you know, the people who say size and strength don't matter are fools. Yeah. It's always better to be bigger and stronger. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, but, but, big, but strength and, and weight and, uh, you know, endurance, and those are all assets. Right. And, and uh, technique is another asset. It yeah. just happens to be the one you can make the biggest gains on. You know, I, I can lift every day and transform my body and become, you know, a much bigger, stronger person. Yeah. But that's not nearly as big as the difference between a Marcelo Garcia who is untrained and one who is. Yeah, yeah. You know, the Marcelo Garcia who's trained has transformed his himself into something to be reckoned with. Yeah. You know, if, if within arm's length he can whip yeah. most people. So, and, and I would, so that's where you can make, huge gains yeah. and in fact you can make gains really quickly on that too you know you can you know if I start if I go down to the weight room start lifting weights today or start on a running program or start rucking or whatever I'm going to do to try and increase my my physical capabilities yeah um, the transformation of that is not going to be very fast yeah but the transformation of technique is really fast as yeah. far as if you pick the right direction you know if you right. you know imagine so so the way striking skills work that means I've got to, I've got to uh, interpret that guy's body motion. I've got to fool him with mine, and I've yeah. got to make effective strikes and movements. That is not a quick transition. Mm -hmm. That takes quite some time to learn. Right. It's a skill set, and you might as well be learning, you know, to play the violin. It's going to take exactly the same amount of time, and you're going to have to use the same method. I'm going to show you a technique. You're going to go do it a million times. You know, the first. First day on the violin, I'm going to show you how to make a note. Yeah. It's going to sound like cats for a couple of weeks until <laughs> after for a while it starts to sound like a good note, right? Yeah. Well, your jab is the same way. You learn that jab stroke, and how long does it take before that's an effective right. weapon? Right. You know, if you learn to you know, rotate it on your, on your spine so you can make torque, so you can get a good strong cross or hook or whatnot, that takes some time. Yeah. And you have to do that while reading his body language and, yeah. and, and you know, anticipating where he's going to be and all that kind of stuff and avoiding his punches. Yeah. So so that method is, is fairly slow and this is one of the advantages that the grappling arts have is that they're, they're it's tactical. Yeah. You know, imagine, what I mean by tactical, imagine why did Hoist Gracie beat all those guys in those early UFCs? Well, he beat them because he had a better plan than them, not because yeah. he had a better technique. He, his, Every one of them came in with the plan of I'm going to hit you until you have received enough damage you can't fight back effectively, you know, right. the universal fight plan. Everybody's got that, even preschoolers, you know. Yeah. <coughs> Hoist's plan was I'll tackle you like high school football, fight for a dominant position. Once I've got a dominant position, I'm going to use the leverage it gives me to 
to finish the fight. You know, right. either by some joint lock or even if you forget that, yeah, feed him his teeth. Yeah, you know, so so that tactical advantage is very comes very quickly. You know, once you've decided to start training, and that's the same sort of tactical advantage. You know, understanding about realistic close quarters gunfighting yeah. gives you. Imagine close quarters gunfight is is all about weaponry and about angles, right? So right. if I if I can be the one who dominates who gets the weapon in their hand. Imagine, um, you know, think about the tactical options. We, we normally train for those right. if y'all listening in. So imagine option one tactically. If you if you think from the principle of it's better to gain control of somebody um, at the longest possible range. So that could be ICBMs from, you know, 5,000 miles away. That's way better than being in the room with them, okay? Uh, in the room with them, if I can... If I can gain control of my voice from across the room or have my handgun out and gain control from across the room, this is way better than putting hands on. Right. Okay. Um, if I put my hands on, now same principle applies. Right. Now once I've once I've once I've established that, then once the fight starts, what that does is give me the most tactical options. Right. It's just just like infantry tactics. In infantry tactics you make contact with the smallest possible element. So if I have hundred and fifty dudes and only four of them are in the fight, well then, I I can maneuver the other 146. Yeah. So <clears throat> that freedom of maneuver came from that principle, and the same right. thing is true here. Range gives me the freedom of maneuver. So right. once once I am engaged, right. and I've done my immediate action. So you know, infantry tactics. That's uh, you know, return fire, take cover, and report to you know higher. Right. Um, then it's time to make a tactical decision. Once I've made that tactical um, that, that tactical decision in infantry is I'm going to attack, I'm going to put in a base fire flank, right. or I'm going to break contact. Well, in hand to hand, that is I'm going to push away, regain weapons range. Uh -huh. If that's not possible, that like they're holding on to me or something, right? Then it might be time to go to a secondary weapon, get myself in a position of control, mm -hmm. go to a secondary weapon. You know, you don't want to you don't want to introduce the, the weapon into the fight whenever you're not in control because right. it's just like giving it to him. Yeah. Um, and once you, once, you know, so that is the second tactical option, gain control, gain yeah. control of the position, then introduce your sidearm. Right. Um, be that knife, ballpoint pen, or, uh, or handgun. And then your last option is what if he starts to go for his weapon? You start seeing him pull his weapon out. Well, now, if I try to go for mine... He's, it's a race, yeah. right? And he's yeah. already beat me to the to the starting line. So, right. so this is a poor option. Yeah. At that point, my option is close in on him. Yeah. You know, or or if I could still break cover and gain contact or something, like break contact and take cover or something, that would still be a viable option. But these are you know split second decisions you're making. Yeah. He's drawing his weapon, hands on, body tackle, hold in place. So you guys got You you got to already have this thing locked in tight. If you haven't, you yeah. If you haven't trained, yeah. If you haven't trained on these, you know. If you're in that scenario training, yeah, you know now now you're you're talking into the world of we're we're looking at the world of mixed martial arts, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, all the people who are doing pretty realistic training, yeah, you know Muay Thai, etc. All those people who are doing live realistic training, are they putting it in context? Right, because it's that number of people is very low. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Which is a great advantage for those who do. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I, I think that's great. I think we should open up questions. Sure. Yeah. Got some questions.